Okay, so let's start up again. Uh, at the beginning of class, we created a new project, a new Maven project for our project four. And we ran that Maven project. And there are two pieces to the Maven project. There is the, uh, the web server, the, the Jetty, and you run that with Maven Jetty colon run. That builds the project, starts up the, the Jetty web container, deploys a web application to it, um, and it's just sitting there ready to do stuff with it. And then there's the other part of the project is the stuff that does stuff with your, with your uh, web application. So we saw that you can use a web browser to interact with your web application. We saw that we could also use a command line tool to interact with your web application. Yeah? What is the Jetty using? When you run Maven Jetty run, what files is it using to so uh, Jetty is a piece of software. It's a Java program, right? Um, and what that Java program does is it serves up web applications. And so the Jetty plugin goes and downloads the code for Jetty, starts up Jetty, and then deploys your web application from your project into that web container. And it configures it and everything like that. That's all taken care of, you know, in the palm. So it's also looking in your source code. Your source files. Yeah, what, what it does. So Maven. Um, okay. So so yeah, this is what I wanted to, to show you. So I'm going to look at the slides um, for. Let's see here. Yeah, foundations of the web. Boy, that sounds pretentious. Um, and I don't want the two by two version. I want. Like a 90s public right. <laughs> the internet. Did you guys see like the public access stuff that Bernie Sanders did back like in the 80s? Oh yeah. Oh my God, that was so hilarious. Anyway. Uh, it was even funnier, like growing up in New Hampshire, because it was like that was right next door. It's like yeah, Bernie, Burlington, Vermont. Anyway, um, somewhere in here, when I talk about oh, this is all that stuff. Let's see here, web container. Um, ah, here we go. Excellent. So this is the this is the picture that I wanted to talk to. Okay, so. As we saw, we've got two processes that are talking to each other. On the right, we have the, uh, we have the web server. And on the left, we have the client, whatever the client is. And the client and the server talk over HTTP. But let's look at what's going on inside the server. So uh, in this picture, the client machine and the, and the server machine are different machines. What we're showing you tonight, everything's happening here um, on my local machine. So you know, abstract that out, but you've got the client and you've got the server. Now, inside the server, well, the, on the server machine, you're running something called a web container. This web container, Jetty, in this case, is a Java program, so it itself runs inside a Java virtual machine. Now, inside that web container are what are called web applications. Now, this is a standard Java, uh, is a Java standard for defining a web application. And what goes in a web application is well, some Java code, so it's class files that implement the logic of your web application. In this case, it's going to have this REST API that is called. It all can also have other resources. So let's say that you've got, uh, you know, an HTML, uh, a, a, uh, a, a website, for lack of a better word, um, uh, application. Well, Inside the, the web application, you can have your HTML files, you can have your JavaScript, you can have your images, you know, all the stuff that comprises that all gets bundled together in something called a web archive, a WAR file, and then it is deployed to the web container. This is all explained much better in the, uh, in the lectures and stuff. What the web container provides is um, routing of, a, uh, of an HTTP request to the appropriate um, web application. Oh, sorry, and inside the web application, one of the pieces of Java code is something called a servlet. And a servlet, as we'll see in a moment, is an implementation of a standard API that uh, interacts, so that, 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 that handles HTTP uh, requests. So here, let's say you've got a web browser that does a get. Right, when you type a, a URL into a web browser, what that does is it makes an HTTP request, a get request um, of that resource, of that URL. And so <coughs> what this does is, okay, it goes, you know, so the, the internets basically find the machine local host on port 8080 and makes a connection to that. Um, in this case, it's our web container that's running. And so then it receives that HTTP request and it routes it to the appropriate uh, servlet. Make it even bigger so you can see it. 
So it's got the configuration that says, oh, okay, um, there is one web application called Site. Okay, in the, in the case of the assignment, it's called Appointment Book. And that routes it to a web application. And that web application says, oh, okay, well, the st slash store um, resource underneath Site goes to the store servlet, and anything that uh, is slash about goes to the about servlet. So what the web container provides, you know, what the app web application configures is, again, all this routing that translates URLs off to these servlets. And then the servlet receives that URL and does something with it. So it looks at the URL, the URL might qu have query parameters. It then you know, takes that request, processes it, and uh, serves up the results and returns the result of that request. So this is the picture that I want you to have in your mind, and there are some couple things to, to note here. Um, I think what's most important is that you've got, first of all, got two processes. And here again, this is probably different from most of the programming that you've done to date, because now you've got two pieces of code that are running concurrently, running in parallel. Um, and what I'm going to walk you through is how to debug this so you can really understand where everything's happening. Because unlike in like your projects one, two, and three, where you can you know, easily sort of trace this calls, this calls, this, and okay, this comes back here and everything. Now you've got two things happening at the same time. It's much more, it's much more challenging to figure out um, what the state of everything is. So that's one thing that I want you to keep in mind. Two processes. But then also, the logic and all of the work happens here in these servlets. And then there's a bunch of routing, a bunch of magic that happens. And Jetty takes care of all of that for you. Yeah. For unit testing, do you test? Should you test like the contents of like a get request, or test the contents before you do a post request, or both? I'll talk about unit testing in a while, though. I want to look at the code, and we'll talk about how to unit test it, um, because it's it's different, but it's fun. Okay. So this is servlets. So anyway, so uh, let's take a look at the servlet. Okay. So the project creates this appointment book servlet. This is a code that runs on the um, on the server in the web container. Now, uh, in projects, well, okay, in Java. Where does a program begin executing? What code? Your main method. Right. So when you start a Java virtual machine, it says, aha, you give it the name of a class, or is the name of a class in a, in a jar file, or whatever. It says, aha, start, start here. That's the main method. And then the main method goes off and does some things, and then eventually the main method will exit. It's a little different, it is different in web applications because the web application is long lived and there are actually multiple entry points into it, right? The entry point is not just the main program, it's these servlets. So what, when you start the web container, what it does is initializes all of this stuff. And one of the things that it does to it when it initializes is it creates these servlet objects. So this is a little different than what you're used to. You've got this long running Java process and in this long running Java process are these servlet objects that are sort of hanging out waiting for someone to send it a request. And when it gets a, gets a request, it does its thing. And the way this works is that you have an object, uh, we have a class that gets instantiated, and it extends the standard API, HTTP servlet, and then it overrides methods that are called by the web container, that are called here by the web container, um, when, uh, when an HTTP request is is uh, w w w for for the URL that is mapped to the servlet. In this case, the URL is mapped to the servlet is um, slash appointments. The appointment book slash appointments. So here's what we're going to do. So well, I'll I'll go sort of high level and I'll go low level. Now, um, this appointment book servlet. Uh, is, is ultimately going to be a REST API. However, it starts out with a simple uh, dictionary. Boy, I gotta update all this stuff. Uh, a dictionary of words and, and definitions. So the class itself, it has some, um, some constants, but it also has this um, map of strings, which is the dictionary. So this is the data that it holds on to. There's one of these things created inside your web application. And then when your web application receives a get, request, the do get method is invoked. This is a method that is inherited from the superclass. And do get has two parameters, an object that represents the request that comes in from the client, 
an object that, re object that represents the response that is sent back into the client. All of these, so the do get method and HTTP servlet request, HTTP servlet response, these are all uh, standard classes that come from the servlet API. And this is the contract that the servlet API provides. So the web container says, okay, listen, if you conform to this contract, if you have a do get method that takes an HTTP server request and an HTTP server response, I will call you. That's where I will direct the HTTP requests for. I will give you an object that when you call it, you know, I'll give you a response object that when you call its methods, I will take the result of that and send it back to the user. So this is the separation of duties. This is the contract between the web container, somebody else's code, and your code, the servo that implements these standard interfaces. So you have methods on the servlet like do get and do post, uh, do delete, and then you got a whole bunch of private methods that implement all of this stuff. So I've heard, you know, provided there in the archetype is this appointment book servlet that uh, gives you the, the do get and implements this simple uh, application. And your challenge then is to uh, take the simple application, sort of tear out the dictionary thing, and put in the support for the um, uh, for the appointment book. Now, like I said, one of the the, the challenges of uh, of working with this code um, is that it's hard to debug. Now, how many of you use the debugger like for your unit tests or or stuff like that? One, two, three. Not many of you, though. Okay. Um, the debugger is your friend. The debugger will save you time. The debu debugger will let you get to the, pr the, the source of problems faster. I don't know how you're debugging your code now. I don't know how you're debugging your tests now, but learn how to use a debugger. Um, you know, be a grown-up about it. So I'm going to show you how to do that um, because I think in Project 4 especially, um, it's key to being able to do it quickly. Now, in Java, to run uh, the debugger, you need to start the JVM with some special arguments. So I'm going to quit the uh, the server that I have running now, and um, because Jetty is launched by Maven, I need to set uh, an environment variable called Maven Ops, and these are uh, command line arguments that it's going to send to the Java VM. In IntelliJ, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch um, I'm going to launch Jetty. In debug mode, and I'm going to use IntelliJ to attach to that JVM. I can set what are called breakpoints, meaning that, hey, listen, when this line of code is executed, stop the world and let me debug that. Let me inspect what's happening there in the JVM and step through the code. The way you do that is you create a run slash debug configuration in IntelliJ, and you want it to be remote, meaning that I'm going to be debugging a remote uh, VM. I'm going to call it localhost. Um, and uh, let's see here, attached to remote VM, yep, and uh, I'm going to say, okay, fine, on localhost port 505, so it talks over a socket also, and what I'm going to do then is I'm going to, this is the C command line arguments for remote JVM, so I'm going to copy this stuff to the clipboard, and I'm going to use this as the value, value, come on, oh, I did it again, it's too low, for my Maven ops, so it's a big agent lib, blah, blah, blah who cares. Um, right, that's all good. Now when I run Jetty, uh, it says, oh, it's listening for, it went by real quickly, but it said, oh, the first thing that the JVM does when it starts up, it says, oh, I'm in debugger mode. I'm listening for someone to connect to me on port uh, 5005. So save this configuration. Now I have a configuration called localhost. And if I click on the debug, uh, the debug icon, it attaches to that uh, to that VM here on five zero zero five. Some of you have used a debugger. Who has seen a debugger? You sort of know what I mean when I say a debugger. So the whole idea is that I've got something that knows what my source code is. And it is matching up that source code with the running code, the compiled code was happening at runtime. And then I can do things like set, I can click over here in the margin, that will set a breakpoint, which means that, okay, I, I go and execute the code. When that code is executed, it'll stop and let me work with that code, let me see what's going on. So, okay, now I've set a breakpoint in my do get method. 
and my do get method will be um, executed when I perform an HTTP get. Well, I can do that by reloading my page here. So I reloaded my page. IntelliJ, which was connected to the uh, to the JVM, realizes that the code was being executed. It stopped the world and said, "Wait a second. Okay, here I am. I'm on line 35 of my servlet. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use the debugger to sort of figure out what the heck is going on. So the request object has all sorts of information there, such as the the URI, the servlet path. Um, let's see here, this thing doesn't have any parameters, so it's probably not terribly interesting from that standpoint. And so then if you go and look at the API for a servlet request, it has all sorts of stuff. Actually, we can, we can do that here, can't we? So we can use the, um, let's see, evaluate expression, and we can say request, and then, oh, let's say um, get, oh, let's say we'll get method. This is an HTTP get. So, this, so the request is a Java object that represents um, the HTTP request. Yeah, question? Um, what were the details for the configuration? For debugging? Yeah, I'll go over that one more time now. So up here under the, um, oops, sorry, under the run debug configuration dialog, a configuration, use a little plus. Now, this is like, oh, look, there are a gazillion different kinds of configurations that you can run. We want the remote configuration, meaning that IntelliJ is going to connect to a remote JVM. You can also have, um, yeah, you can also have IntelliJ run the Jetty, I think. I don't know how to do that. It may be a little error prone. Um, I like sort of doing stuff on the command line, so I'm doing it this way. So you create one of these things, name it localhost. And then you can set some other configuration, things like what port and what, uh, what host. Because, right, I mean, if I could be debugging something that's running on one of the PSU machines, for instance, instead of my laptop. But the important thing is to add this thing to the command line. And there's an environment and variable called, uh, all caps, maven underbar ops, O-P-T-S. Set that, and, um, and that will, uh, uh, and then launch it in debugger mode next time you run maven. So every time you run Maven, it'll launch uh, when it launches the JVM. It will uh, put this on the command line, which will then allow the VM to be attached to via debugger. Um, this is something I should probably uh, explain in the Getting Started Guide. Um, someone do me a favor and create an issue in the Getting Started Guide uh, repository saying, "Hey, you should explain this," because it probably would have come in handy, like say three weeks ago. So, I'm attached to that VM. That VM is just sort of sitting there waiting for something to happen. Yeah, another question? Huh. On the previous topic, so yeah. then after you get that command line, you just run Maven J run with that parameter. Same thing, yeah. And because that environment variable is set, the envir environment variable is there part of the scripts and stuff, or it knows to look for it, and then it puts it on the command line. Can yep. we evaluate the expressions with the watch list on there as well? Or? Oh, yeah, you can add stuff to a watch list if you want to have something that's always evaluated. Right. Yeah. Okay, so what the debugger has done is it's paused the program here at this line and it lets you inspect things. Um, so let's take a look at what it's doing. The first thing it's doing is calling set content type on the response. Now, you guys might have heard of MIME types. The whole idea is that, uh, you know, there's data, but you also want to know like what kind of data it is. And this is like really important for, uh, for the web because HTTP deals in text, and so therefore binary information is encoded somehow. So like when you, you know, uh, like have a website that has a JPEG in it, um, if you go and request that, that JPEG, what's sent down is actually a text encoding of it. Um, and part of the information, part of the metadata about that data is, uh, is like what type of data it is. So it's like, hey, it's uh, the, the and so what basically what this is saying is that, listen, the, the type of data that I'm sending to you is t plain text, text slash plain. <coughs> and that is a standard um, uh, content type, the, the MIME type, for, uh, for the data. If we were serving up a different kind of, um, uh, of, of data, we would use a different kind of content type. And this way the client knows how to interpret it. So we do that. Oh, okay, and so we're going to use the um, step into, no, step over, F8, to go to the next line. So I'm telling IntelliJ, okay, hey, please have the code execute until it gets to the next line. 
So now uh, what I have is I have a call to the get parameter method. Now get parameter is a method that's here in this class, so I'm going to use the step into or F7 to step into that. Now I'm executing the first line of get parameter. It takes uh, a request and the name. And so what this basically does is it wraps the um, get parameter call and handles nulls and empty strings nicely. So now I can step uh, over this stuff. And so when I ask the request, hey request, what is your parameter? So, so sorry, HTTP requests have these key value pairs associated with them, these parameters, all right? And, and we'll see in a minute um, uh, sort of how all of that works. So um, the name here is word. There was no parameter that is word, and so the value will be null. So now the word that was there was null, which means I'm going to then call the write all dictionaries entry. So what does it do? It gets a print writer. Now, print writer is an interesting, is an interesting class. So when you call response.getWriter, it returns a print writer. Now, response is part of the servlet API, but when that API needed an object to represent a bunch of text, it didn't invent its own. Instead, it used print writer, which is from the Java IO library. So what the servlet API here is doing is it's reusing classes from another API, a standard Java API, to represent something that uh, you can write text to. And so now uh, I'm going to go through and uh, I'll step into this, which is simply a, uh, a little method that goes through and then prints some text to, well, that print writer. In this case, the print writer is the, um, is the HTTP response. And so I go through, all the, uh, go through all the entries in the dictionary. There are none right now. And so I can use the debugger to inspect the dictionary. It says a size of zero. And this is the dictionary, well, it's passed in, but it's actually the dictionary that comes from the servlet itself. I've now handled the, uh, well, I've now written everything I'm going to uh, write to it, so I flush the stream. And I set the response on the, sorry, I set the, the status on the response. So, you know, you've probably seen HTTP 404 or 500 or 402 or something like that. The HTTP standard defines all of these exit codes, not exit codes, all these status codes. So uh, this is all part of the, the contract that HTTP provides. And so then it's got a data format. It's got the verbs like get and post. Um, and then uh, on the response, it says, okay, great. Here's the, you know, the body of the response, the payload that came back in the response, and also the status. Hey, was this you know, a good request? Was it handled fine? Great. Was it an invalid request? Did I encounter some error? There are you know, dozens and dozens of, of, different, um, of different error codes. Um, and again, that's all covered in the lecture. In this case, we're just going to use SCOK, which is 200. So HTTP 200 is, uh, means everything's okay. I'm going to set that response. And now I'm here back in my do get method, and I'm done. And so now I return. Oh, it looks like it's all it's now handled. It's now someplace else. So I'm just going to say continue. Is that this one? Yeah, resume program. And now it's running again. If I go back to my browser, now my servlet has, my, my do get method is done. It has written the text that it's, uh, it wrote to the response and delivered that back to the browser. So this is the interesting thing that you're dealing with. You're now dealing with, again, two processes. I'm doing something over here in my web browser. And then on the back end, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm handling that request. Real quick, I'm going to go back to the command line, and I'm going to um, I'm going to add a new pair. Um, me a name. Okay. Now I'm going to walk through. I'm going to reload this page, which will then do another get request. Right, my pro my my web server is still running. I hit it again. Okay, there's the uh, no, there's a get method again. So now, let's take a look at the request that we got. Um, now, if we look at, I'm sorry, if we do the evaluate expression, we say request dot get um, get parameters. 
get parameter map. Wait a second, what did I do? Oh, I did, I did get alt again. That's probably not what I wanted. Sorry, here now, I, sorry, it's not what I wanted to do because it's just going to tell me the same thing before. So now when I do that, it's going to return a uh, dictionary has one word. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to look something up. And the way I look something up is I say word equals me. So what I'm doing is here in the URL, I'm adding a parameter to it, the word equals me. Now when I, when I hit the URL, it again stops my program. And I'm going to, uh, once again, look up the request.getParameterMap. Now it's got one thing. The word, uh, the, there's a word pair, which is, uh, oh, interesting. There you go. Uh, the word is me and the value, sorry, the word is word, the key is word and the value is me. So again, this word me here in the URL gets translated by Jetty, by the web container, into this map that's associated with a request. So this is all part of the contract, right? So here is the Java API that is representing the HTTP request that's coming in. And so now I've got that. So now when I go and I uh, call my get parameter method, when I say get parameter, the value of, sorry, the, it's kind of hard to see, name here is word. When I say get parameter, the value that I get out of it is me. Cool. And so now that I do that, the value is me. Here, the uh, now in my logic, I say, well, the word isn't me anymore. I'm going to write the definition. So what I do here is I get the definition of the word by looking it up in my dictionary. I get my print writer again. I'm going to uh, write the, uh, the definition, that the word and its definition, to the string. I'm going to flush it, and this is a good response again. So I'm done with my get method. I continue on, and there it prints it. So the idea, here again, the idea is I'm using the web browser to uh, hit my URL, and I can set a breakpoint, and I can work with my code. I can figure it out by, by debugging it. Now I want to do something else. I'm going to go to the command line. I'm going to add a new word there. And I'm going to, now, when I, uh, so, so uh, you'll learn more about this in the lecture, but HTTP get is really meant to be a read-only operation. Like, fetch me some resource. It doesn't change the resource. It doesn't, doesn't mutate anything on the server. HTTP post, on the other hand, you are sending, well, you're making a change, and very often you are sending it some information. So when you do an HTTP post, you're, you are creating a new entry in the dictionary by providing a word and a definition. <coughs> Fa along one word. What? Okay. Now, when you, uh, so when I run the, this program, it'll do an HTTP post, which will then invoke a different method. It'll invoke do post. So I'm going to set a breakpoint here in do post. Okay. So now I'm here in my do post method. Again, what do post is going to return is plain text, so I set that first. Now I have different logic. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get information from the, uh, from the, from the post, and I am going to, uh, I'm going to do some error handling. So uh, I'm going to get the, the word parameter again. So word here is fa. Oops, there we go. Fa. Uh, it's not null. Uh, if it was, I would, uh, well, let's see here. How am I going to do that? I can, I'll show you a unit test. I think that'll, that'll do that later on. So I go and the word is not null, so this is good. I'll go and get the definition. If the definition doesn't exist, then, uh, oh, sorry, if the definition is not provided, the definition is not provided is also an error. Otherwise, I've got a valid word, I've got a valid definition, put it in the dictionary. Okay, and this right here is the actual application logic, right? It's put in the dictionary, and then I will uh, just simply return to the user a little message saying, yep, here's what I define the word as. Set the status okay, and there I go. 
And the command line program prints out the thing that it returned from the server, which in this case is a little message saying, okay, define fa as a long, long way to run. So that's what's happening on the server side. You've got the servlet object. It's got these two methods, do get and do post, that are invoked when a get request or a post request is made of that URL. Before I move on, let's pause for questions or commentary. So <coughs> my debugger says the application is running. <clears throat> that means it's just waiting for something to happen. It's running normally, it's not hitting any breakpoints. Right. At that point, I run it and I do the, you know, put in a definition. You hit a URL, and yep. If I have a breakpoint anywhere in like the do post method that should get, it should start, it should run. Yes. Or, or yeah, any code that's executed, even if it's like called three levels down, you put a debug, you know, debugger a breakpoint there, it'll stop. Okay. It's not doing anything. No. Maybe your code's not being called. Well, I'm, I mean, it, but it's working on my request server, and it just was. It was running a little bit ago, and then I... Oh, did you detach from it? I stepped out, and it says the application's running. Okay, so you're it looks like you're attached to it, it's just not hitting a breakpoint? Yeah. Interesting. Is your breakpoint inside a conditional? Because if that condition's not being met, that breakpoint's not being met. It is not. Well, so, I don't know. We can debug that later. Okay. Debug, debug. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you have to do the setup process every time you restart the server? You mean you have to set the environment variable? Set the environment variable every time that you have a new shell. So when you open up a new terminal, okay. right? But you, it should, yeah, you, you should only have to do it once. And you, it's setting environment variable. That environment variable, environment variable lasts as long as the shell lasts. Resetting the connection. I just I hit the, like, the green restart arrow. Yeah. So I don't know why I was telling the application. Okay, so you might, might have detached from the VM then. Okay, but it knows it's still running? Maybe. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Oh, oh, no, wait. Did you do... Um, yeah, you hit you hit this thing. Run the line where the carrot is, and so it flushed and it was like done. Yeah, that I, was on, I was on pw .flush and I clicked the run to the line where the carrot is. Yeah, and then it gave me like the like a blue dot. I was like, the application is running, and it wouldn't go back into the. Yeah, it might be that. Yeah, I don't know. I'll right. top of my head. Okay, that's what's happening on the server side. Um. Someone asked about unit testing this. So servlets are interesting because a lot of this code is the servlet API, right? And this code is meant to be run inside a web container. And the web container does all this heavy lifting, like creating the HTTP server request object and sending it in, and then creating the, the servlet response object and sending it in. Um, and there's a lot of logic there, right? I mean, if you look at this, um, well, let's just take a look at this. Uh, no, 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 I don't want that. Download sources. If you look at, um, at this class, okay, it's in a while the Java doc. There's like a ton of methods here. Um, there's a ton of functionality. So if I've got a method like do get, how do I how do I write a unit test for that? Because in order to call this method, I need to provide it one of these request objects. And there's a lot of stuff in this request object. Any ideas how you might want to do this? Well, first off, you don't want to have to do it. So the the you know you. you so what, what you want to do is you've got a lot, of, a, a lot of logic. You will do what you do in your assignment, where you have like separate classes that implement a lot of the functionality, like your appointments and your appointment book um, and your pretty printer and stuff. And all of those have nothing to do with the servlet API. They're called by your servlet, but they aren't the servlet itself. All of that logic can be unit tested more easily, right? You've been doing it. Right, so that's 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 one way to approach it. Say a great, you know, I want to keep my servlet as small as possible and just delegate off to um, other uh, other code that can be more easily unit tested. So that's probably the right thing to do. However, um, I've also got uh, servlet test. I do have a unit test that tests the servlet, um, and this uses uh, a, a library that creates mock objects. So. 
the servlet um, API has a bunch of interfaces. As a matter of fact, uh, all of the, let's see here. So yeah, HTTP servlet request and HTTP servlet response are interfaces. So remind, so remind me what an interface is. It's one of your quiz questions, right? What's the interface? It's like a class, but it only has methods. Yeah, it's a type in Java that all it specifies is a contract for behavior, not an implementation of that behavior, and there's no state associated with it. So it's just this, yeah. It's a type with a bunch of methods. Well, um, there are two lectures uh, associated with this week. One is all about the web. And the other one is all about something called Java Reflection. Now, I think you've encountered Reflection a little bit in the cones, right? And it was kind of like, well, what's weird is going on? Well, you'll want to watch that lecture because this is one of the more mind-blowing things in Java. What Reflection allows you to do is uh, have super dynamic code that does things like, and say, just, hey, give me, if you give me some object, I want to find out what methods could be called on that object. And then you can interrogate that object at a runtime. There's a library called Mockito, which provides what are called mock objects that implement an interface, um, but, uh, but, but, but implement interfaces in such a way that you can uh, send that implementation of the interface off to a method and then interrogate that object to say, hey, what methods were called on you? And what methods with what values were called on you? And what this allows you to do in the case of your servlet is allows you to unit test the servlet without having to run it inside a container. Because you've basically provided mock implementations of the HTTP servlet request and the HTTP servlet response. Your code doesn't know any better, right? Because it is conforming to that interface, because it is conforming to that contract. It's like, okay, well, it's given me, you know, all I know is that I've got a servlet request. And I know that that servlet request has a whole bunch of methods, and I can call those methods, and... Uh, you know, I expect them to do certain things, but as long as that contract is fulfilled, I don't really care what implementation of server request is, right? I don't care if it's J's implementation. I don't care if it's a different uh, web container's implementation. All I know is that it provides that interface. Well, that's cool. So what you can do is you can use this mock library to test out your um, to test out your server. It's super wacky stuff. It's um, but it's also really powerful because now I can write a unit test for my servo, servo without having to like spin up a whole web container and all of the stuff uh, involved with that. So the way I do that is I say, okay, well, I ultimately what I want to do is I want to call the do get method. So the first thing I do is I create my servlet and the, the servlet is just a Java object so I can create it right here. It's got zero arguments in its parameters. And then I want to call my do get method down here. Um, and I need, to, I need a request and I need a response. Okay, well the request is an HTTP request and the response is an HTTP response. And I use this Mockito um, API which has a method called mock which basically says, okay, go off and do some magic. I'm going to give you the Java line class for a type and you're going to return to me an object that implements that type uh, that provides all of the methods uh, but isn't but and provides all the methods. I can then use that with my do get. So I'm going to make a mock uh, request, a mock response. Now when I uh, interact with the the do get, what I want to do is I want to make sure that when I send in the appropriate parameters, that the output that I expect is written to the response. Okay, what does the uh, well, the, the, the thing that, that, that writes to a response, what does it write to? Well, it writes to a print writer. So, okay, I'm going to need a print writer, and I want one of these mock print writers. So something that implements the print writer interface, or in this case, I think it's the print writer's a class. Um, but give me one of these fake ones that I can use in my test. Right? Yeah, totally crazy stuff. Okay, so I've got a pretend, I've got a mock request, I've got a mock response, I've got a mock print writer. Now, inside my code, when my code asks for the print writer associated with the uh, response, I want to give it that pretend print writer. So the way I do that is I use another API that comes from Mockito called when. And I say, okay, well, when the get writer method of my pretend response is invoked, then return my pretend print writer. Crazy stuff, but it works. So what you're doing in your unit test is you're kind of creating this pretend servlet environment with these mock objects 
that provide the behavior that you want. And it's like, okay, I got this pretend stuff, and you sort of drop it into your code under test, which in this case is the do get. Your do get just executes it. It doesn't know that it's pretend objects. Who cares? It just goes and calls all the methods that it wants. Calls methods like get writer. The fact that it gets a pretend print writer, meh, who cares? It's a print writer, right? So it writes, so it does all the things that it does. And then what you do is you say, great, I've, I've sort of done my given, given, I've configured everything. I've done my execution, done my when, and now I want to make sure that the APIs, that, that, that these objects, these mock objects were interacting with in the way that I expect. So um, I expect that zero words will be, uh, will be returned here because I'm doing a get. There's nothing in the request. I haven't, I, I haven't created any data yet. And so then you use another Mojito uh, method called verify. I want to say verify that my pretend print writer option, uh, object had its print line method invoked with the string that is returned by this helper method here, format word count with zero. And I also want to verify that my response had its set method, sorry, set status method invoked with the value OK. And you run it and it works. Famous last words. Is there expanding the imports? Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm debugging. Uh, no, I didn't do that. Yeah, there's a there's all this uh, org mojito mojito stuff there. Sounds like a word for a non-alcoholic mojito. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I prefer the mojito kind for myself, but um, that's just me. Is there a simple explanation for why the compiler lets you create those objects if there's pretend? The compiler? Well, you're basically... Well, like, why, why can you create a print writer object that is not a print writer object? Magic. So, there's... And actually, that's the, that's the easy implementation. There, there, explanation. Um, there are APIs inside Java that allow you to synthetically handle methods. Um, there's something called a dynamic proxy. There's all sorts of stuff in reflection. Oh, right, it's so fun. It's so cool. Uh, it's the advanced and advanced Java programming, right? So... Um, uh, so what Mojito does is it leverages those built-in APIs to create these pretend objects. Um, and then, uh, actually, lots of APIs um, do stuff like this. You can have, like, pretend objects that, like, will uh, do remote method invocation. So you've got uh, an object that actually lives in a different process on a different machine, and then you can get a local proxy to that. You can call, it's like, you know, you can call a method here, and then, like, all this magic happens and basically invokes it over there and returns its result. Right, that, that's like what all of this is for. And here, what the magic does is basically, the magic implements all this bookkeeping, right? So it keeps track of like, oh look, this method was invoked with this parameter. And then in verify, it consults all that bookkeeping to say, oh wait, you expected that print line was called with this string value? Oh look, it was, it passes. Or it's like, oh no, this wasn't invoked, oh and it fails. Um, and so what this allows you to do is keep your code under test, sort of using the APIs that it expects, and then sort of passing in all these special objects that are smart that you can interrogate afterwards. So there are fields in the mock objects that store the results of what they do? Yeah. Okay. So basically when you call that method, instead of, um, when you call a method like set status, instead of actually like setting the status, it just keeps track of like, oh, set status was called with this value. Yep. Anyway. Um, Super neat, very powerful. Let's you do some cool stuff. Won't be on the final exam, but um, I, it's here again. This this is like here again. This is like you know big kid programming. Um, this is like what you need to do. But but look now you can test your servlet, and there's a lot of power in that. I want to walk through another example, which is okay. What, what is it like to add one word to the dictionary? And here, what we're doing is we're testing a post. So now we need to do some more complex setup because we're basically simulating, we're mocking out an HTTP POST request. So what do you do? Well, you say, okay, I'm going to create my mock request again. And you're going to say, listen, when the request, when the mock request get parameter method is, in, is invoked with the value word, then return the value of this variable word, test word. Same thing with when it's invoked with definition, then return test definition. Right, so basically what you're doing is you're training the, the mock object to behave in a certain way, the, the behavior that you need for the test. 
And now you create the response again. You set up the when the git writer is um, is called, then return the the mock print writer. And then you call your code under test, code under test, the do post. And then you verify that oh yeah right, what was written to my print writer is what I expect. The defined that uh, that the word was defined as uh, as that. And then we get an HTTP OK. Your servlet code doesn't know the difference. Your servlet code doesn't know that it's invoked with a pretend HTTP uh, servlet request and a pretend HTTP servlet response. It doesn't care. It's just calling the methods. And so this way, your, your code doesn't need to know that it's being tested because you've mocked out the environment in which it, with which it interacts. I encourage you to play with this stuff. It's uh, it's super cool. It's super powerful. It's also super complex. And when things go wrong, you'll have to do a lot of reading uh, to to figure out why. But when it works, it works really well. Yeah. Uh, the PW print writer goes in and comes back out with a value as it goes going in by yeah. Reference. Well, it is right because when you call get writer on the response, you're going to get that print writer object. But the, the local PW doesn't need to catch it. it doesn't. It's it, it so the here again some more magic with Mockito. This sets up the mock object to say, hey, when get writer is invoked, you know what you're going to return is this print writer object here, and so then this is all passed, this is all made available to your do post method through the response object. Yeah, pretty cool, right? Eh, kind of crazy. Anyway, um, that's super fun. So I think this is everything I wanted to show you on the uh, on the server side. Any questions about the servlets or how to unit test it? You'll have more next week, don't worry. Okay, let's take another break. Uh, a quicker one this time, so let's go until 8 o'clock. Because um, we still need to talk about what happens on the client side. So it gets even crazier on the client side. Getting your money's worth tonight, aren't you? Yeah. Thank you.